Okay, so, second part of the cave metaphor. <clears throat> I'm going to draw it really s crude and simple here and just go for the outline, considering you've already um, seen uh, how the cave itself works. So this is the inside the cave, right? So he calls the inside the cave the visible world. And this is the outside the cave, what he calls the intelligible world. Now, there are several levels of truth. There are two inside the cave and two outside the cave. Now, the two outside the cave are called one, the shadowy image, two, the object or artifact or thing sometimes, then three, we get to, uh, let's start at four actually is better to understand, the thing in itself is what he calls it. And then finally, well, I guess not finally, number three, the image of this, of thing in itself. Now, these are the various levels of truth. And remember, the, the point is, it's you know about enlightenment, right? So the journey of the soul is to hear, right? To see things in themselves, ultimately. And this, he also will call form. So form becomes the highest level of truth in all of this. And form is the thing in itself. And I want to come back to form in a little while. Um, because it's kind of hard to understand. But to finish the cave metaphor, remember our guy had gotten out here. Remember here our uh, cave dweller whose chains were broken gets out here and he sees things as they are. <clears throat> then what Socrates says is, um, what about when he reminds himself, this is at uh, line 516C. And what about when he reminds himself of his first dwelling place, his fellow prisoners, and what passed for wisdom there? Don't you think that he counted himself happy uh, for the change and pity the others? Certainly. Then as it goes on, what Socrates says is, now suppose our guy were to go back into the cave and sit down here with the other prisoners. And what would it be like? Well, he would be out of his element, for one, because he's used to truth out here. And if he's used to truth here, and he comes back into the world of opinion, then he's not going to be able to understand what these people are up to. And at line um, D, so 516D, Socrates says, These people get their honors, praises, and prizes from understanding the shadows. So in other words, these people get their livings their standard of living, their income, the rich, clevy, clever, and honorable ones are the ones who can figure out which images come first, second, and third. In other words, the key to success to these people here is to figure out what the puppeteers want of them. And when they can figure out what the puppeteers want, that's when they get their honors and prizes. In other words, their standard of living, their careers. So when this philosopher, the guy who gets out of the cave, the guy who is more concerned with truth than he is with opinion, and he's also more concerned with the intelligible, in other words, the rational, than he is with the visible, in other words, the um, physical, then what you get, tripartite soul right here, right? This is the world of the visible and the social, and this is the world of the intelligible. And so the aspect of our soul which leads us out of the cave is exactly reason. Reason, emotion, appetite. And the journey of the soul is thusly, right, in, in each circumstance. 
But so when our guy goes back in, he's not going to be able to understand these people because these are people who only understand what they're told to understand. And they're they're chained. Remember it said that they're chained because they are stuck in understanding reality in terms of the visible. And so they understand things only in terms of how does it physically benefit me. In other words, it's what do I get out of it? So when you say, you know, oh, I'm going to college, what are you studying? I'm studying X. Well, what does that get you? Right, that kind of concept. Where everything has to be about its physical payoff um, in the, the world of the visible. Um, and so if our philosopher goes in there, he's going to be at a disadvantage because he doesn't share the same reality. In fact, these people's reality is very small, right? Um, their reality, if you think back to Parmenides, between the not and the is, if you remember, uh, these people here don't even know that this world exists. So they're completely cut off. So if someone is enlightened and gets here to see the world of the intelligible and to see the forms and to see truth as it is, these people have no clue about it. And so when he comes in here to tell them, oh, hey, there's this whole level of reality here and these guys have been lying to you the whole time, then as Socrates suggests, they're going to kill him. Um, where does it say that? Yeah, in line 517, he says they'll ultimately kill him. So you, well, the philosopher has to be careful about going back into the cave because these people don't want to be told that their whole truth is a lie. Nor do these people want some philosopher going in there and moving everybody out of the cave because their uh, money and power depends on people being in the cave. And so, you know, you can see obviously the, the cave metaphor is a rather uh, powerful um, you know, image of any society ultimately. And the point is that real reality comes in understanding the forms, but the forms are eternal and unchanging because truths, whoops, unchanging, sorry, I ran out of room there. Truth doesn't change, right? Truth always is. But opinions change constantly. And so this is the world of becoming because nothing ever is what it is. It is always in a state of either growing or dying, basically. It's always in a state of change. And you can't have real knowledge if knowledge changes. Knowledge cannot change. It must be unchanging. Therefore, forms are not visible they are only intelligible, so you can only know them, you cannot see them. So they are invisible. How can I write that? Where? Here we go. The forms, the highest level of something is invisible. Um, and that's why they're also very difficult to know. And very difficult to know if you know, because how would you know? To even try to put in words the truth of a form, you would have to sort of come down a little bit um, and use images to describe what you're talking about in terms of the highest truth, which is so ironic because the cave itself is an image to try to encourage people to not need images. There's certainly a great irony in these things, but I mean, how could you describe the indescribable except to use words? Right? So you run into this odd paradox. And there's a certain truth. St. Thomas Aquinas evidently once said that, you know, theology and philosophy point to the truth. They point to it. And the words used by philosophers are meant to turn one toward the highest level of truth. Um, now, in St. Thomas's estimation, that would be God. Or you could think of the good itself, which we'll come to in a little bit. Um, which produces the forms. But at any rate, the, the words are meant to orient us to a higher truth. But he said human nature is to get caught up in staring at the fingertip. And indeed, that's the case. So, you know, these words that we're using, and these images that we're using, the point is to try to understand a reality which is much larger than can ever be encapsulated in words in the first place. But words is all we've got. Okay, well, let's... Uh, this. 
image is getting rather complicated. So perhaps we'll say this is the cave part two. And so please look at the cave part three.